All right, good afternoon. My name is Mike Curon, and welcome to the, the latest in CAE Associates e-learning series. Today we're going to be talking about conjugate heat transfer using ANSYS CFX. A few, uh, one administrative note before we uh, go and get started. We uh, will be offering one PE credit for this, uh, attending this session. All that we ask uh, you to do in order to earn that PE credit uh, is to participate in the two polls that we'll put on during the uh, webinar and then also our follow-up survey. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get started with the, uh, with the webinar. Our agenda for today, uh, first we're going to talk about what is conjugate heat transfer. So, um, you know, what, what is the reason we're here today? What are we going to be talking about? Um, and then we're going to talk about some geometry and mesh concerns for conjugate heat transfer simulations. Next, we'll talk about setting up a conjugate heat transfer model and solving it. And finally, we'll talk about post-processing conjugate heat transfer results. Now, if at any point you have any questions or, or um, uh, concerns, please uh, try to submit them to the Q&A or chat windows. Uh, we'll have both of those going, and I'll, I'll try to address anything uh, time permitting uh, at the end of the webinar. Okay, so what is conjugate heat transfer? Conjugate heat transfer is the coupled solution of conduction in solids uh, and convection in the surrounding adjacent fluids. So we're going to be solving the Navier-Stokes equations in the fluid domain, and we're going to be solving the heat conduction equation in the solid domain. And at the interface, so where the solid meets the fluid, we're going to solve for the temperature and heat transfer coefficients, uh, and they're going to be determined by the local energy balance. So we don't have to assume or make any assumptions uh, regarding the heat transfer coefficient. Uh, that's going to be an outcome of the solution. It'll be dependent on the flow, and it'll be solved for uh, during the run. And, our, and the outcome, the overall outcome of a conjugate heat transfer analysis is the temperature distribution through the solid and the fluid, and out insight into the cooling or heating characteristics and efficiency of our flow field. Now, where do we see uh, these types of example, uh, these type of analyses or, or, or devices? Um, one example is electronics cooling, and that's what we'll be using in our demonstration today. But we also see them in turbo machinery. Um, a new or a, a, a particularly hot topic now is data center cooling and HVAC, and things like automotive underhood cooling, and many, many other, and other topics and other devices uh, as well. So not just limited to these, uh, we see these in a lot of, uh, of different um, industries. Okay, so what we're going to do now is go through a step-by-step -step procedure for po performing conjugate heat transfer analysis. Now I'm going to use a, is the, in the demonstration um, a PCB that has some heat dissipating components, um, and it's going to be in a natural convection environment. But the key steps that we're going to go through uh, to perform the analysis uh, are also applicable to other C uh, conjugate heat transfer analyses for other devices. So, you know, the main ideas here that we're going to talk about uh, can be applied to whatever device it is you're uh, analyzing. So the first step is the geometry. Now, in, in any CFD analysis, we're going to want to extract our flow domain. And we're not going to cover that too much here, uh, but it, again, it is important uh, an important step in any analysis. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, to take a look at the, our previous e-learning seminar on building flow domains. And you can download that on uh, our website um, and, and have a look uh, at what we talked about there. Now, the key difference in a conjugate heat transfer analysis is that we want to uh, make sure that we keep the solid bodies. So we're going to need to mesh those and include them in the analysis. So rather than extruding the flow domain and then suppressing the solids, we want to make sure we keep them. A second key uh, uh, thing to keep in mind is that we're going to have different domains that are going to need to interface with each other. So we're going to have multiple solid domains. We're going to have the solid domain interfacing with the fluid domain. And we're going to make sure that anywhere where those, uh, those two domains meet, that we have a nice uh, uh, topology that represents the interface. So for instance, on the board, where we have the chips and the heat sink, uh, et cetera, sitting on top of the board, we want to make sure there's a, a face on the board that matches exactly the outline of the heat sink. So when we set up our interface, that's the, the two faces that are going to be used. So the one face on the board and the one face on the bottom of the heat sink. Now there's two ways to do this in Design Modeler. The first is using a body operation. 
we're going to make sure that the uh, the board in this case would be uh, an, uh, unfrozen, so set to an active uh, body, and then we're going to use the body operation imprint, and then use the anything that's lying on the board to imprint those faces on top of the board. Now another method to do this in, in a slightly easier way is to form all the solid bodies into a part and set the shared topology method to imprints. And this will do the same thing uh, in, a, in a more automated fashion. So I encourage you to try those out. Once our geometry is, um, is set up and we've imprinted our faces, the next step is going to be to generate a mesh. Now, if you haven't already, I encourage you to to visit our uh, our website and check out the e-learning webinars we've put on for CFD meshing uh, and generating inflation layers. Um, certainly be very helpful uh, for these types of analyses. The few concerns that we have that are uh, that we're going to want to concentrate for a conjugate heat transfer analysis, uh, first and foremost, in the fluid domain, wherever the fluid meets a solid, we're going to want to make sure we generate inflation layers. So we're going to want to make sure we accurately capture the thermal boundary layer around the solid bodies. In addition, anywhere we have two domains meeting, so where we're going to set up a domain interface, we're going to want to make sure we have similarly sized meshes. So we're going to use local controls in the meshing module and make sure that the mesh looks of similar density on either side. Again, we don't want to lose information when going from one side to the other uh, because we will be interpolating. And finally, anywhere that we're going to have a boundary condition or we're going to have an interface or we're going to have um, a, a, a something that needs to be scoped in CFX Pre, we're going to want to create a name selection for that in meshing. And the reason is it's much easier to do that in meshing than it is in CFX Pre. So if you go ahead and do that work ahead of time, creating name selections for, for uh, almost all the faces and the, and the bodies, that'll make your life a lot easier down the road. Okay, at this point, what we'd like to do is take a, a quick uh, break here and do our first poll, and we'd like to get your feedback on what tool everyone's using for conjugate heat transfer analyses. So let's take a minute and get your feedback here. Okay, it looks like we have um, a little variety in, in the attendees today. We have um, some people using mechanical, some people using CFX and Fluent. Again, we're going to do the demonstration in CFX today, but the principles are the same in Fluent. So the same ideas that we're going to talk about, you're going to be able to use in Fluent. Um, and hopefully we can kind of streamline your processes here today. Okay, so once we've generated our mesh, the next step in our process is to bring that mesh into CFX Pre. And once we're in CFX Pre, we're going to start setting up the model. So let's take a look at what that looks like. If I open up CFX Pre, here's my mesh. And what you see is everything gets lumped into one single domain. So even though I have all the solid bodies and the fluid bodies, it's all going to be in one domain, and I have to start separating that out. Now, the way that I like to do that is to work from the outside in. So I pick the uh, domain on the outside, and I set up the details for that domain first, and then work my way in. So if I right-click on the analysis and insert a domain, I'm going to call this flow domain since I know that's on the outside, and I go ahead and pick the flow domain geometry. Now from here, I have to figure out a few details. For the fluid domain, first I'm going to want to try to classify the flow. Do I have free convection or do I have forced convection? And a nice way to do that is to evaluate the Richardson number. The Richardson number is a measure of how important the buoyancy forces are. So if I have a Richardson number that's much less than 1, that's going to indicate I have a forced convection and that the buoyancy effects are really not going to be that important and can probably safely be ignored. On the other hand, if Richardson number is much greater than 1, I'm going to have free convection and I'm going to certainly need to uh, include the buoyancy effects. And if I have Richardson number of the order of 1, I have a mixed convection scenario, and I'm probably going to still need to include the buoyancy effects. 
Now, when setting up the fluid domain, um, the next step in my procedure is to evaluate what material that I'm going to use. So if I come down the list here, I have a fluid domain, and I'm going to pick my material. And the material choice has consequences on, uh, on what type of, on how we're going to model free convection. Now, if we have small temperature changes and small density changes, we can use the Boussinesq model, which approximates the body force term in the momentum equations, as being related to the local temperature difference. Now, the key advantage here is that in the rest of the equation, the Navier Stokes equations, the density is treated as constant. So that's a major reduction in the nonlinearities uh, and greatly simplifies uh, the analysis and much more stable. Now, in the, in the uh, event that we have larger temperature differences, we're going to have to use the full buoyancy model, which models the, bo the uh, body force term as is. Now, the, the way that we, um, that we uh, introduce one of the other models uh, into, our, into our CFX simulation is first to set up uh, our buoyancy. So if we want to specify the, uh, the domain as having buoyancy, we set the direction of gravity. In this case, we're going to have uh, gravity act in the negative y direction. So let me set that up here. And g is a, a gravitational constant. And then depending on which material I choose uh, will dictate what uh, buoyancy model I use. So air at 25C represents a constant density material. And in that case, if I choose that material, I'm going to be using the Boussinesq uh, hypothesis for buoyancy. On the other hand, if I pick a uh, material that has density as a function of pressure and temperature, or a compressible material, then I'll be using the full buoyancy model, so something like the ideal gas uh, law. Now, in this case, I'm going to use the Boussinesq approximation uh, and set the, the buoyancy reference temperature to 25C, which is my ambient temperature. Now, another thing to consider here is the speed of the flow. If you have a low-speed flow, um, and let's say you, you, you don't have natural convection, let's say Mach number less than 0 0.3, then it's okay to use a, um, a, an incompressible or constant density material. On the other hand, if you have a high-speed flow where Mach number is greater than 0 0.3, you're, you're going to want to use uh, a, a material that's compressible like the ideal gas law uh, for air, something like that. Okay, the next step in our, our process um, once we've set up the, the basic settings on the basic settings tab, is to move on to the fluid models tab. And we're going to have to choose the energy equation that we're going to solve. Now, in this case, obviously, we don't want isothermal. We like to solve for the temperature distribution. So we're going to need to, pr to choose uh, between uh, the thermal energy and the total energy equation. For low speed flows, Mach number greater, less than 0 0.3, the thermal energy equation should, should be sufficient as it uh, doesn't take into account the kinetic energy effects. But for higher speed flows, we're going to use the total energy equation. From there, what we want to do is, is determine whether our flow is going to be turbulent or laminar. Now, in a forced convection scenario, what we're going to, the, the dimensional number that we're going to use to make that determination is the Reynolds number. So for an, a flow over an obstacle, we're going to use a critical Reynolds number of something like 20,000. Whereas an internal flow, it's going to be much lower, around 2,000. For natural convection or free convection, we're going to use the Rayleigh number. And the Rayleigh number, uh, typically, for values greater than 10 to the ninth, is going to be fully turbulent. However, transition can occur as low as 10 to the seventh or 10 to the sixth, depending on your device. So we're going to have to take care to choose, um, choose whether our flow is turbulent or laminar, and then make the appropriate choice for our domain. Okay, so I should be all set for our flow domain here. And what I'm going to do is continue on setting up the rest of my domains, the solid domains. And the way that I do that is first hide the fluid domain because it's kind of obscuring everything. And then I can zoom in and continue on with my solid domains. So let me do the board first. Insert a domain, and I'll call that the PCB. I'll pick the board up and set it to a solid domain. And the key here now is that we have to specify the appropriate material for each domain. Now, in CFX, I have um, a, a subset of materials that are automatically listed. But in this case, this, this, the materials here don't really fit the, uh, the, 
the material I'm looking for. So I can either create my own, or I can go ahead and take a look in a built-in library and import that library data, where CFX has a number of different common conjugate heat transfer solid material properties uh, that I can import. So here what I want to choose is the glass plate material, which kind of represents FR4. I'm going to go ahead and import that and set the material appropriately. And the only other thing I want to ensure here is that the heat transfer is indeed set to thermal energy to make sure I'm solving the conduction equation. And then I should be all set. Now what you see is actually, let me do one more domain. I'll do the, uh, the heat sink real quick so I can show you how the interfaces get generated. So I'm going to set the heat sink to be aluminum. And so now you see I have my default domain, which is the remainder of the, the lumped domains that I still need to specify. I have the flow domain on the outside. I have the heat sink and the PCB specified. And as I've been generating these domains, CFX is automatically detecting any interfaces. So I have the default solid-solid interface, which at this point is only going to be, be between the board and the heat sink. And then elsewhere, I have the fluid-solid interface. So anywhere where I ha I'm interfacing uh, between, let's say, the heat sink and the board and the, and the fluid that's existing. So these are automatically getting generated. But with any automatic tool like this, we're going to want to make sure that we we go ahead and verify that the interfaces are being accurately captured. So are the, are the correct surfaces being detected? And if we take a look at a model I've already set up, what we can see is I have the correct default fluid solid interface and the solid solid interface, which captures everything that gets attached uh, from the board to the, the components uh, on top of the board. Now one last thing I can do for the interfaces, let's say, for instance, between two solids, I wanted to include a contact resistance. Well, in the details of the interface, on the Additional Interface Models tab, I can specify an interface model that has a thermal contact resistance, and then I can specify whatever that resistance value would be, and that would be included in the analysis. So a useful little, little tip there um, that you can take advantage of for your simulations. Now the next step in our procedure here is to set up the boundary conditions. Now in this case, I have the board just sitting in open air. So my external fluid domain boundary conditions are just going to be uh, something to approximate the ambient condition. So if I look at my flow domain, I've picked the outer surfaces of the flow domain and set that to an opening. So the opening is going to allow flow to go in or out depending on the on what it wants to do locally. And the pressure and temperature are going to represent my ambient conditions. So it's going to be a zero relative, uh, a zero gauge pressure and an opening temperature of 25 degrees C. So that's going to be my external ambient condition. Now in this specific case, I don't have any uh, velocity inlets or mass flow inlets, but if you had a, a force convection case, you could certainly uh, include uh, the appropriate conditions there. Now for the board, what I have is some heat dissipating components. So for example, these chips or the transformer are all dissipating uh, some amount of heat. Now, in order to do that, in order to add a volumetric heat generation rate, what I want to do is insert a subdomain. So if I right click on the transformer domain and say insert a subdomain, we'll keep it at subdomain three for now, and pick the location, what that allows me to do is specify an energy source. So I can specify that source as a watts or, or per, per cubic meter, or a total source, which would be watts. And I've already done that, so you can see in subdomain 2 here, I have the source set up as a total source uh, dissipating uh, the, the given amount uh, of, of heat. I've done the same thing for the, heat, for the, uh, the chips, set up a subdomain that's going to dissipate some heat. And that's going to do it for the boundary conditions for this natural convection flow. Again, you can include other types of boundary conditions. Let's say if you had um, a, a particular face that was at a fixed temperature or a known heat flux, you can certainly include uh, that type of boundary condition. If it's a, for instance, if it's a wall with a fixed temperature, I can choose the locator and then set the temperature 
or the heat flux to be a specific value. But in this case, we should be all set for the simulation as far as the boundary conditions go. The next step in our procedure is to set up the numerical parameters. So if I go on down to the solver control section, what I'm going to be able to set here is my numerical parameters for the, uh, for the discretization schemes, as well as uh, the number of iterations and convergence control. Now, typically, I like to set the number of iterations to be a, a, a sufficiently large number. I think the default is 100. I like to set that to either 500 or 1,000. This way, it doesn't stop before converging, uh, even though typically we'll, it should converge in, in a uh, small amount of iterations. Now, the key to a conjugate heat transfer analysis is, even though this is steady state, we have two time scale controls. We have a fluid time scale control and a solid time scale factor. Now, we can set these to different values because we're not concerned about the time accuracy. These are just going to be allow us to march towards that steady state solution. And typically, what I do is set the fluid time scale control uh, time scale factor to a value of 10 to begin with to see how that works out. And I'll always set the solid time scale factor to at least an order of magnitude higher. The reason being is the solid time scales are typically much longer than the convective time scales, and we can get away with, or we can, uh, the solution will still be stable with a much, um, much larger time scale factor. So we can get to that end solution uh, much more quickly uh, with a larger time scale factor. And this is um, certainly uh, applicable uh, to you know, a, a conjugate heat transfer analysis where we have the conduction in solids. Finally, we're going to set our convergence criteria. And for now, I'm just going to keep the default 1 to the minus 4, although I may want to come back and, and tighten that up later. Now, the last thing that I want to do before going, going on to solve is to set the output control. And what I like to do is set up some monitor points so that I can monitor the solution during runtime. Now, what I've set up here are two expressions to monitor the temperature uh, in the heat sink and in the transformer. And the way that you do that is just to add a new uh, monitor. And I'll create one for the chips and create an, an expression. And this can either reference an existing expression, like I've done uh, for the other um, monitor points where I have a, an average uh, temperature. Or you can just type, type the expression right into this, uh, uh, into this box here. So this would represent the volume average temperature of the chips. And so I can monitor that as the solution progresses. OK, at this point, what I'd like to do is stop for our second, um, our second poll and get your feedback on which step of your conjugate heat transfer analysis usually takes you the longest. We have a couple more people left to answer. OK, so it looks like a lot of us are spending time in, in setting up our analyses um, and also meshing and geometry import. Um, and certainly, that's, that's about typical. But hopefully, our e-learning seminars can, can help streamline your, your processes. OK, so our next step, once we've set up our model, is to generate a solution. So we come back to the project page here and just right-click and edit on solution. That will bring up the solver manager. Let me bring that over to my shared screen here. And here we can set up our uh, different uh, run settings. So we're going to be able to specify whether we want to do a serial run or, or a, a parallel run. Again, a, a C, a CFD solutions tend to scale very well in parallel. And while they require extra licenses, an HPC license, um, it's a very powerful uh, tool to, to increase your solution speed. So once we set that off and kick it off by starting the run, let me open the monitors from the, uh, from the solution that I calculated. 
And what we can do is monitor a number of different things here. So we have our monitor screen with the residuals as well as the output file. And what I like to do is keep an eye on not only the residuals and how they're decreasing, want to make sure they're uh, monotonically decreasing, but also the user points that I set up. So you can see at my final solution, the heat, transfer, the heat sink temperature and transformer temperature are really no longer changing all that much. So we, we don't have too much uh, variability, and that gives me a good indication uh, that my solution is converged. Now, another thing that I like to monitor are the, are the domain imbalances. So I want to make sure that since we're solving the conservation equations uh, in, these, in, in, in our fluid and solid domains, that, the variables, that the, the variables that we're solving for are, in fact, being conserved. So I'm not creating energy uh, artificially. Um, I have a small imbalance. So I like to, to, to monitor that because when solid dom domains are included in the analysis, it may take longer for the heat imbalance to tend towards zero than for the residuals to meet my given or my chosen uh, convergence criteria. And it's important to ensure that those imbalances are small. So that's why I like to monitor them. I like to check that information out in the output file. And also sometimes I like to use a conservation target as an additional convergence criteria. So if we take a look here at the residuals, you can see when the residuals cross 10 to the minus 4, somewhere around uh, time step 45, if I take a look at the temperatures, my temperature is still uh, about 3 degrees C from my final temperature, at, at least in the transformer. So I'm not fully converged yet. And in addition, the imbalances, my max imbalance is roughly 4%. So I'd like to really get that down uh, to less than 1%. As you see, I have um, when the when the solutions fully converge. So by monitoring not only the residuals but also some integrated quantities and the imbalances, I get a much clearer picture of whether my solution is converged or not. Okay. After I do get my converged solution, I want to bring that information into CFD Post and and take a look at my results. So the first thing I'm probably going to want to do. To take a look at my temperature distribution. So if I insert a contour plot, and I'm going to select the fluid solid interface and plot up the temperature, and I get pretty much exactly what I would expect. I get a, a um, hot regions in, in where I have my uh, heat dissipation, so around the chips and the transformer. The heat sink is much cooler because that's helping to convect the, the con, uh, uh, draw the heat away or out of the board. And so everything looks physically reasonable. Now, some other things that I like to check or, or uh, investigate, uh, the next thing up is probably let me take a look at the, the flow distribution. So what I have here, I've plotted up some streamlines. What, I, what my flow looks like, since uh, gravity is acting in the negative y direction, I have the flow being drawn in from the bottom of the board and being convected upwards due to, the, due to the heating of the fluid. So it's drawn around the transformer and the chips and the heat, through the heat sink and convected upwards uh, into uh, the wake region. So you can see that I have a hot area right behind the transformer, right where the chips are, that really are not being sufficiently cooled. So maybe I want to evaluate this device and say maybe I can move my uh, my big flow blocking object, the transformer, and, or maybe move the chips back so that they could be cooled by the flow more effectively. And one last thing that I'd like to check out is maybe I have some, uh, some uh, criteria for maximum temperature, and I want to see if anything exceeds that temperature. So if I insert a volume and set the method to isovolume, I can create an isovolume based on a temperature. So I'm going to set it to have any temperature above 60 degrees C be highlighted. So you can see those chips in the same region I just highlighted are going to almost all be uh, above my, my criteria here, so above 60 degrees C. And maybe I can go back and reevaluate uh, using my, my, my solution uh, as to what that, how I can make some changes um, uh, by moving things around. Finally. If I want to get some, if I want to extract some quantitative data, let's say I want to get an average temperature uh, in the board, 
I can use the function calculator. So if I, uh, I can access uh, these various uh, quantitative functions, such as area averaging, uh, mass flow averaging, maximum values, et cetera. In this case, I'll use a volume average of the temperature in the board. So I can quantify what that uh, average temperature is. So there's a lot of really powerful tools in the function calculator that you can uh, harness in order to quantitatively uh, evaluate your design. Okay, that's all I have uh, for our demo today. Hopefully you guys got a lot out of it. In summary, uh, conjugate heat transfer simulations are going to enable us to, uh, uh, to assess the heating and cooling characteristics of our device and how efficiently um, our design is uh, performing. And the key points that we've covered today, while we demonstrate them on an electronics cooling application, are certainly applicable to any other type of conjugate heat transfer analysis. So the same steps of setting up our geometry and imprinting faces, creating inflation layers um, and similarly sized mesh on either side of our domain interfaces um, are all going to be applicable to um, you know, other types of conjugate heat transfer analyses. And finally, ANSYS Workbench provides a streamlined set of tools from design modeler to meshing to CFX uh, or Fluent um, that are, are streamlined just for performing these type of analyses from setting